Hello, uh, welcome. My name is Benjamin Penny. I'm from the Australian Centre on China and the World. My guest today is Professor Benjamin Elman, the Gordon Wu 1958 Professor of Chinese Studies from Princeton in the United States. We're very lucky this year that Ben has agreed to deliver the G.E. Morrison Lecture. The G.E. Morrison Lecture is the longest standing public lecture at the ANU. In fact, it began before the ANU began in, 19, in the early 1930s. Uh, when the ANU was formed in 1946, uh, the then Vice Chancellor decided to reinvigorate the Morrison Lectures and it's been going annually ever since. The list of lecturers from Australia and from overseas represents the cream of Chinese studies, historical studies, contemporary studies, humanities, social sciences, and so on. Uh, the cream of scholars from around the world. So um, it's an incredible honor for us that uh, Professor Elman has agreed to give the Morrison Lecture for this year. Um, he's visiting Canberra just for a few days, but we have an opportunity to have a, a short discussion now. So welcome, Ben. Thank you. Um, your lecture tonight is about the development of science, mm -hmm particularly in the city of Shanghai mm -hmm. in the second half of the 19th century mm -hmm. into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd just begin by suggesting to you that Shanghai was a pretty incredible place mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the second half of the 19th that's century. Right, that's right. It was a, a test base for the Chinese government under the Manchus and also for those that were coming in, uh, Brit Brits and others that were working uh, to try to modernize China. Uh, from the outside. Shanghai was, uh, in many ways, uh, three stories. One was the Qing Dynasty government, which was uh, uh, in the south, and then the, in the north, the, the, the Europeans, particularly the British, had taken on personal power in certain kinds of areas, uh, and they were putting putting together a uh, it's kind of not friendship society. Uh, they hated each other initially, but they worked together against the Taipings in the 1860s and 1870s. And that sort of forged the beginning of a link of you help us, we'll help you. And the British felt that the forces felt that they could get the, their, gain advantages of access to the Chinese government under the Manchus through this uh, aid package they had constructed where uh, uh, British, Scots, Americans came to work in Shanghai in the customs office. And the customs office was an open opening to modern finance, modern uh, uh, policies, uh, and major policies at, at, at that time, and major uh, finance at that time, uh, because uh, the Qing had a lot of money, and at times pay, and it paid exorbitant, uh, uh, losing uh, battles and losing wars amounts of money. But they uh, had to pay a indemnity every time they lost lost the war. So the British advised them in terms of modernizing uh, the, uh, uh, the trading mechanisms that the Qing met with the outside world. And so it was an interesting dialogue between British and Dutch, British and uh, other Europeans who worked in the uh, customs office working with the, the Chinese magistrates who were in Shanghai uh, working with them as well. And Shanghai was the one place this experiment could go on. It went on in, in Hong Kong to a degree, but Hong Kong still was far south from the, from the government and where many of the things were happening. And Shanghai was placed right in the center of the most prosperous region, the Suzhou region, uh, where it was a minor uh, 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 district. It now became a special action uh, area. And the British and others, uh, Chinese Gordon served the, the military there, was hired by the, uh, the, the, the Chinese and Manchus to build up a military power against the Taipings and ultimately opened the door to modern mechanization, modern warfare, modern naval forces, uh, mm -hmm. and the like in that area. So it became a kind of uh, interesting interaction where uh, I think there was genuine uh, appreciation for each other. Mm -hmm. And the, the Manchus uh, and the Chinese ma uh, major officials saw this as an opportunity to catch up with the rest of the world. They had to pay indemnities. How should you pay them? And so they parked they came up with a scheme for using the uh, uh, interest from their uh, donations and other programs to pay for the, 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 the debt that was owed over a period of 20 to 30 years. Sure. So, so it was a, a, a remarkable in, uh, mutual interaction. Yeah. Well. At the place, yeah. yeah. So the, the kinds of people, the kinds of foreigners who mm. are in Shanghai, so you've mentioned Brits and mm. Americans, mm -hmm. other Europeans, there were some Australians there too. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about well, we're talking about military people mm -hmm. that you've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. We're talking about governmental people, mm -hmm. consuls mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. translators and mm -hmm. interpreters mm -hmm. and 
bureaucrats of that's various right, sorts. That's right. But we're also talking about missionaries, aren't mm, we? That's right. And the missionaries from largely Protestant churches, although mm. Shanghai, of course, we shouldn't forget, was one of the great centres of the Catholic Church in, mm -hmm. in China as well. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't just bringing what they saw as the word of God. That's right. They were also bringing a lot of, I mean, a lot of these missionaries spent their time, if we look at what they actually did, they were translating works of mm. medicine, of That's geology, right. of right. astronomy, mm. of right. cartography, and so on and so forth. And, and in a way, it was a real um, a passage of information, mm -hmm. a passing of information from the West That's right. to China through mm. scholarly work, through mm. publication. That's right. Well, this was not, the, the British and the Europeans in the Northern European scene were not the, for be, the ones to begin this process. The various Jesuits mm. that came from Spain, Spain and came from uh, uh, Italy, they uh, tried to do similar kinds of things in the 16th, 17th and 18th century, but then they lost out to the papal office. The papal office disbanded them, and they were left with next to nothing. And then uh, the interference of uh, various outside forces that led to the Opium War made the dialogue between the, part, the, the uh, Catholics and the Chinese uh, pretty much moot. And uh, the Jesuits that survived remained in China, who was protecting them from the other areas. In the 19th century, the uh, various Brits and uh, others that came in, they were mediating a second stage, and they were operating with Chinese uh, officials, and they were coming for the church and coming for uh, these different kinds of faith, but in the end, they wound up working for the Chinese government. Mm. Uh, this had happened with the, the Jesuits as well. The Jesuits were for God and country and for uh, faith, but in doing this, they began to recognize that they, uh, the Chinese would respect them more when they could demonstrate their prestige in astronomy and mathematics for the Jesuits and for the uh, Europeans, and particularly the British in the 1860s, 70s, and 90s, in this industry. The rise of the engineer, mm. the rise of science and technology in the newer forms that hadn't existed before. This was what the Protestants in particular were very important for. And so it was the ironic church brought in uh, church fellows to promote Christianity in the uh, 1860s, 1870s. But the Chinese recognized these people were uh, very knowledgeable in these areas of medicine, mm. science, and engineering in particular. So the rise of the engineer in China formally, as opposed to uh, kind of an ideal person who knew how to deal with things and build things or whatever, the, the, the new post-calculus uh, uh, groups of engineers, technically trained, came from this uh, interesting dialogue in, from the 1860s in the Taiping Rebellion to defeat the Taipings. The newer technologies were employed and the newer naval tech, uh, ships mm. were employed. So it was an interesting uh, mutual ad admiration society. And the Chinese you know, gave in a little to the Protestant interests of these fellows, but for the most part got what they wanted in terms of you, you, you do this and we'll pay you. Sure. Mm -hmm. You mentioned medicine. I think mm -hmm. medicine's a really interesting case sure, sure. because one of the things that the Protestant missionaries brought in particular, uh, many of the missionaries were medical missionaries. That's right. some, of them were, um, some of them were preachers and mm -hmm. scholars That's and so right. forth, people who translated the Bible mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But some of them opened clinics. That's right. Um, I'm, I remember one particular case, uh, one of the, the great scholarly missionaries, Joseph Edkins, mm -hmm. when he was in uh, mm -hmm. Peking. Um, he worked with a medical missionary. Mm -hmm. And some of the sources mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. his career indicate that um, uh, which diseases mm -hmm. they preferred right. to treat. Right. Uh, and... They said that, that, you know, they because they were bringing medicines that the Chinese didn't have. So um, uh, one of the things that was easy to cure was skin diseases. Yeah, the Chinese may not have had the medicines, but they had the, the, the illnesses. That's right. And so one of the advantages they had, ironically, over the British and others from Europe coming in, dealing in a wintry climate with different kinds of parasites, is that the Chinese were dealing with their local tropical and po tropical yes. uh, parasites. So the... British and others who came in, these weren't the Oxford, Cambridge, Don's medicine. This, they weren't pay, staying in, 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 in Europe, in England, in France. They were going with the, 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 the trading mechanisms, the, 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 the policies of the government to, to help do these kinds of things. And so they were themselves knowledgeable about the diseases, but had 
didn't have the diseases in Cambridge, didn't yes. have the diseases yes. in London. They found the diseases in China, where we're all what we're finding now from the parasites in this current uh, uh, crisis. Go back much earlier mm. to the Ming the native Ming crises, interacting with uh, Central Asia, interacting with malaria in southern southern uh, China and South in Southeast Asia. So these aspects were bringing the, the 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 Americans and the Brits for the most part into the new question of what is the newer medicine. The older medicine was basically idealized in terms of uh, ideal techniques, ideal approaches, but they never entered the framework of, well, what do we do with the framework of being a tropical medicine, mm. the location of the medicine, the kinds of issues that come up when you do tropical medicine. So the, the, the British doctors became world famous and actually Nobel Prize winners because of their activities in, in, in China and also Japan and, and India, where these exchanges were going on. And so it was ironic that the lesser known doctors, the poor doctors coming from Manchester and elsewhere were sent out to yes. do these, uh, uh, this menial work and it opened the door to uh, uh, new techniques, new knowledge and the rise of tech, uh, tropical medicine. So <laughs> in many cases, these doctors were the pioneers of tropical medicine. At the same time, I mean, mm. fascinating story, but it goes the other way as well. Mm. And you find the, as you say, the rise of the engineer in China. Mm -hmm. You also find the rise of the doctor, That's right. the kind of more Western trained, but a kind of more professionalized mm -hmm. idea of what a doctor could be. Even people who, who, mm. um, who use traditional Chinese medicine mm. started mm. at least through the 20th century, late 19th and into the 20th century, started establishing practices that look much more like Western medical practices. Right. So there's a kind of a very interesting way that Shanghai mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a locus for developing not just information transition mm -hmm. and transmission, but it's a place where Westerners are learning things mm -hmm. that That's they've right. never seen before. And a challenge their That's own right. sciences and their own well, the treaty, techniques. The, the, a challenge. The, the treaty ports became an, an opening for these kinds of techniques, these kinds of problems, and they themselves suffered these diseases because they didn't have the, the resistances to them. So many of the doctors who uh, began to master the new tropical medicine, they were actually curing diseases that they themselves yes, often had. Uh, and many and of so, their colleagues died. That's right. I mean, it, people, would, people would people would go to the. That's the, right. Wives and families were. Their dead. wives and families were very yeah, susceptible yeah, to, to. This was the beginning, I think, of, a, of an interaction that we see beginning in the early 19th, in the early 20th century, uh, when the very great epidemics broke out during the First World War, mm. and in, Man in Manchuria there was a huge uh, uh, sc a scandal of in incompetence in the medical field among the Manchus and Chinese and the Westerners who could come in to help out. So rather than hiring the Westerners, in many cases they did this in Shanghai, but in the, the Manchurian campaigns they brought in many of their own doctors or Chinese doctors that, have been that came from Malaysia, came from Penang and went on to be trained in Scotland particularly, uh, and trained in London and elsewhere, they came back and the Brits and other Westerners wouldn't hire them for the, policy, for the, the jobs in medicine and epidemic control and the like here. They went to work for the Qing Dynasty. And they brought, through that, they brought modern medicine and the role of making sure that you uh, control the, uh, uh, the epidemics. And the way to control the ep ep epidemics was to separate people out into their proper categories. Who had far along in this disease, who was lower in this, this, this disease, who had res resistances. So slowly but surely, tropical medicine was leading this new powerhouse of medicine coming through. That the cutting edge was not France, not England, or even the Americas, although there was a good deal of that uh, in, the, in there. They were in introducing China to the new techniques of organization. Ah. And the Chinese love organization. Mm -hmm. So this fit in very nicely. And then you found a place for the uh, Jesuits in astronomy. Here you found a place in medicine. And so you've spoken about, well, the Jesuits in astronomy and these 19th century mm -hmm. Westerners in engineering mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd speak a little bit about geography, mm -hmm. map making, cartography, mm -hmm. geographical knowledge, because in a way, the 19, across through the 19th century after the First Opium War, you find the access foreigners have to mm. different parts of China increasing. That's right, that's right. And there's an awful lot of exploration, mm -hmm. both about mm. simply where rivers went mm -hmm. and what, right. what was going on in certain provinces. Mm -hmm. You find people going there, botanists going, mm -hmm. collecting plant right. materials, yeah, particularly yeah. tea for the that's tea industry. Right, right. But you find all kinds of... Uh, geographical knowledge mm -hmm. being... Um, yes, yeah, so the Jesuits 
they actually were hired by the, the, the Chinese Manchus to give the boundaries of their uh, territories because they uh, had a rough idea of what, whose was what. But now that the Russians were coming in and other groups were coming into the North, North, Northeast, Northwestern Corridor, they needed to know the exact board boundaries. So they brought the Jesuits in to do that. The Jesuits gave them the techniques and how to deal with that. And ultimately, in terms of geography, they were pioneers. Uh, for this kind of thing. So the Jesuits had a great deal of influence. That, that influence carried over to the Protestants. The Jesuits and the Catholic Church are basically have a, a failure narrative going after 1780 because they were disbanded and their a mo mo order, order was destroyed. This was left after for a, a generation until the uh, uh, Opium War that the interaction moved forward in terms of medicine in terms of the sciences, the engineer and the knowledge of science per se was being brought in together with these often British, very much many Americans and other Europeans bringing in through the faith of Protestantism these new ideas in science. Mm -hmm. And it, it took avenues that many of the uh, uh, British doctors were not uh, aware of where they were going. They didn't know they were going to found tropical medicine. They knew they had opportunities to do things uh, that they couldn't do in England that they couldn't do in other areas. And so it was, in many ways, the Oxford-Cambridge thin defense of modern medicine in Europe that had little to do with the rise of the new medicines, the new role of epidemics and breaking open understanding of how to control diseases and how to control epidemics. And that became a key issue for the Chinese to move in and say, we've got the problems, we've got the scale, you give us the big answers. And so the Protestants, in many ways, along with the, the, the Japanese and others, jumped into this and said, yes, we understand the organizational techniques. And the tropical medicine is geograph is geography. Top, tropical medicine is where we learn about elephantiasis, learn about these other so-called marginal diseases that had been uh, impoverishing Chinese uh, peasants and local uh, groups for to centuries. This enlarged the capacity of the Chinese on an organizational basis to control these new diseases and to move forward for not only knowledge in China, but transfer that knowledge to the other colonies and the rest of the world. Uh, so tropical medicine became the place to be. And it was the British that invented it, although the Chinese had talked about it in terms of heat diseases. Yes, of course. Heat, heat, uh, heat diseases and cold, cold diseases and their organization geographically into different kinds of problems mm -hmm. that you had to come to grips with. So this was the cutting edge uh, of that time. So this is, this, yeah. is, um, uh, this is a time when things are really changing, mm -hmm. when, when in a way, even though at, at that time, Shanghai and China more mm. broadly was seen to be something on the edge mm. of interests in London or in New York mm. or in mm. other places. But in retrospect, we're talking about somewhere that was really one of the driving forces, mm. not only for the development of, of aspects of Western science, but also, and more importantly, the development of Chinese science itself. Mm. So right. I think, um, thank you so much mm. for having this discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the lecture this evening mm -hmm. will be uh, fascinating and you'll expand on a lot of these ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so um, from me, from mm -hmm. the Australian Centre on China and the World, from the ANU in general, thanks so much, Ben. Thank and, you. And um, we look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you for your questions.